All right, let's, uh, I say let's dive into it then. Um, so uh, welcome back to Archaeology, everybody. Uh, my name's uh, Bill Farley um, here at Archaeology Tube. And um, today uh, we're going to do something a little bit different and do kind of a, kind of a, kind of a low key, a chill interview uh, with, uh, with uh, Dr. Flint Dibble, who I imagine most of you know well at this point uh, from from uh, his uh, science communication uh, online and and uh, you know maybe most notably in recent uh, months for uh, going on a debate on the Joe Rogan experience with Graham Hancock, uh, which um, has largely been seen as a, a quite successful. Uh, today, I'm I'm going to give uh, Flynn a chance to introduce himself in one second, but just to give you an introduction here. You know, um, we're going to kind of focus on the before and after of that experience today a bit more, since I think the debate itself has been discussed uh, to death uh, by everybody uh, everywhere. Uh, and and so trying to do something a little bit new, you know, thinking about maybe what the motivations were for doing this. And then also, where do we go from here now that the debate is over and we go forward? So uh, let me throw to you here, Flynn, for a second and give you, give you a chance to introduce yourself, uh, you know, who you are, where you come from, uh, what you're doing these days, uh, anything you want to pitch, that sort of thing. Great. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Flint Dibble, and uh, I run an archaeology channel, Archaeology with Flint Dibble, so you should come check it out if you like real archaeology, good stuff. Um, another point is I am currently, for one more hour, <laughs> a Curie Fellow at Cardiff University. Um, my contract is about to end, and then next term I will be teaching there uh, a few classes. It'll be fun. Um, so I'm an archaeological scientist, and uh, I specifically focus on um, animals and environment and people in uh, the ancient Mediterranean, usually in the Greek world, um, though I've, I've worked on projects that span the Paleolithic through the medieval period um, and all over the Mediterranean as well. Um, so yeah, so that's what I am, and I, I'm very passionate about archaeology. I really like doing it. I enjoy sharing it. I enjoy teaching it. And uh, I sort of want to make sure that people have a sense of what we do today. I find a lot of people in the world uh, don't really understand what archaeology in the 21st century is. They have this idea of either Indiana Jones or of kind of really like, you know, the finding of King Tut's tomb. And so there's this really early 20th century idea of archaeology all as discovery. And so I, re I really want to push back against that and share what we do, why we do it, why it's relevant, why it's cool, and why some of the, the, the people that... Uh, that are pseudo archaeologists, why they shouldn't be so popular and why we should be. <laughs> I th I'm, I'm with you. Yeah. So, so yeah, of course, um, one of the things I'm always doing on here is trying to get people to uh, sort of subscribe to some of the great uh, people who are making content online in various mediums. So, you know, make sure you subscribe here, of course, but also, of course, have Flint's YouTube channel in the description uh, so you can get there. It's pretty easy. It's, it's basically just 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 his name. So pretty easy to find here on YouTube. But go over there and uh, and give that a subscribe. Uh, so my first question, uh, as I said, sort of focusing on before and after this debate on Joe Rogan experience was, um, what made you sort of decide to to do it? Because I know that it was a a controversial decision. There is there is not a consensus within the science communication community or within the archaeological community that this sort of thing is necessarily a, a good idea, or that there was fear that it might have bad results. So uh, I was wondering if you'd walk through your your thinking on that. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll try to not tell the long version and not tell the short version, but split the middle here, and. Uh, this really goes back even to my childhood. I got into archaeology because my dad was an archaeologist, right? And so I have been uh, surrounded by, you know, cutting edge modern archaeology my entire life. And in many ways, I think that that somehow makes me slightly different than many of the other people who engage with pseudo archaeology. Um, many of the people that engage with pseudo archaeology and are really prominent about it, they actually started off reading pseudo archaeology as a kid. And I've heard this from many people, David Anderson, even John Hoops, and others have told me that, the, you know, Carl Fegans of Fraudulent Archaeology, Wall of Shame, um, they, got, they, they got interested in archaeology through things like Atlantis or Hancock or aliens or whatever, different of these different uh, aspects of pseudo archaeology. And, and so then they, they went to university and they, they learned what real archaeology was and they stayed interested in it. But they've always sort of kept an eye on that sort of uh, category of pseudo archaeology, and they wanted to help people 
make the same understanding of the field as they they got when they were younger. And so they sort of explore the history of pseudo-archaeology and stuff like that. And in many ways, I'm very different because I was never, ever, ever into things like aliens or Atlantis. And uh, like ever. No, it was never something that really interested me as a kid. And so uh, so uh, what I realized is it's just how popular um, in particular Atlantis is. And I realized this sort of during the pandemic when there were a lot of people going online and watching YouTube channels on in particular lost civilization theories. Those became very big during the pandemic. And I was at the same time growing my own following on Twitter, writing Twitter threads about my research. And I would be bombarded with questions about Atlantis and lost civilizations and the Sphinx. And I thought to myself, man, I don't know much about this stuff. I can't answer these questions. And so I started, you know, researching it as a hobby just to be able to answer people's questions. And I quickly realized that, A, this is really, really, really popular. And uh, B, it doesn't seem like many people are actually addressing it from an archaeological point of view. Many of the people that go out and debunk it, they go out and talk about the historiography, the history of ideas, how Graham Hancock's book is a direct descendant of Ignatius Donnelly in the 19th century. And so, and I think that's an important thing to do. I'm not trying to critique them, but what I'm trying to say is that I think that, uh, that I have a different perspective on, 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 on at least in my mind, <laughs> maybe I'm being too arrogant here on, on, on how to address this topic in, in today's world. And what that is, is to actually try to take it somewhat seriously, to actually say, hey, all right, if we're going to look at this idea of a lost civilization from the Ice Age, what kind of evidence can we actually use to prove and disprove it? Right. It's not just showing that this idea comes out of Ignatius Donnelly. It's not just sort of saying, hey, Atlantis comes out of Plato. It's actually saying, what is our evidence from the Ice Age? If you see what I mean, and how does that bear upon this idea? And so uh, in that sense, before the Joe Rogan debate, I had some success on that with Twitter threads and a few articles about a few different shows, Hunting Atlantis and then Ancient Apocalypse. And I found that that kind of approach by foregrounding the real archaeology was was effective. It's sort of uh, it, it, people who weren't sure about things, it gave them the answers and information that they craved. What is our actual evidence during the Ice Age, you know, for what people are doing? Um, and so that was kind of always at the forefront of my mind, um, was to take a slightly different approach um, in going in there and debunking it, let's say, and to try to teach what we actually do at the foreground. What do we actually know that relates to these questions? Um, and so that was always at the foreground. And then as I started doing more research into how to approach pseudoscience in general, I found that really aligned with what I was thinking, which is that you, you pre-bunk instead of debunk. So instead of letting somebody talk about their evidence for lost civilization of the Ice Age, I talk about the actual evidence for what happened in the Ice Age first, right? And so that's how I started developing my whole strategy. And my one request when I started talking about doing this with Graham uh, was that I get to go first. That was my one demand, to be able to set that stage with what we do and how we do it and how it impacts this question of a lost civilization. And so the, having that different approach was one of the main reasons. And then the second one was after the ancient apocalypse came out, the conversation online had gotten very <laughs> spiteful and vitriolic. Um, and I, I wanted to try to calm things down. I mean, Graham was out there calling John Hoops a coward. John Hoops was constantly posting about Graham on Twitter. And uh, and I felt like a lot of us were, we were talking past each other. And I thought, you know, it, the only way to really see, present to people what's going on to be heard even is to actually sit down in this kind of venue. And so I, I wanted to do it because it was such a large venue. I'm going to be able to reach people so that there's going to have an impact rather than me writing a Twitter thread where most of the people that read it are either going to be fans of me and other real archaeologists or hardcore fans of pseudo-archaeology and Graham Hancock or aliens or whatever I'm writing about. And so I wanted to be able to appeal to people that were in the middle that weren't big fans of either sides. And for that, you need a large venue. And so Joe Rogan, of course, is the largest online venue in the world, maybe the largest broadcast venue in the world, just period. And so uh, so it seemed like a good opportunity to try to I felt like somebody had to do it. And since I had a different approach, I wanted to try my hand, if you see what I mean. And I want to, you know, sorry, let's one last thing. Also, I think it's important that we do this kind of engagement is another key thing, like ethically. 
as an archaeologist, I think we we have to engage with the public. And because of the popularity, that's my own research. I'm writing a book on Atlantis. I actually just signed with a, book, a literary agent to try to uh, sell this book and get it published. And uh, so one of the things in my own research into Atlantis has come across is that it's increased in popularity so much in, in the last 15, 20 years. And you can see this in English language books, not the internet, books. Google Ngrams has a database of these. Atlantis is mentioned more commonly than major archaeological sites like Stonehenge or the Sphinx or the Acropolis or Pompeii. It is also mentioned more than major Greek historical figures like Alexander the Great or Pericles or any of our major Greek figures that you can think of. And it's also mentioned more frequently than most conspiracy theories that are out there like JFK or the moon landing or ancient aliens or any of the really popular conspiracy theories you can think about. And so, and this is all due to growth in the last decade or so. So it's, it strikes me as if it's really important that archeologists actually address this because belief in Atlantis is sky high. Like the majority of Americans or about 50% of them, according to polls that have been done uh, by what, uh, oh, I'm blanking. <laughs> Can you pop up the image of that poll at some point? Chapman uh, University, can't. Chapman yeah, University, and the the Survey of American Fears. It's shown consistently since they've been doing it over the last six years or so that about fifty percent of Americans believe in Atlantis or some other similar lost civilization from the Ice Age with advanced technology. And so this is a pervasive belief. It's not like a minor belief, and it overlaps significantly, as you know, um, as I've seen you tweet on on Twitter uh, with, and I know as well from my own experience, with other pervasive conspiracy theories like anti-vaccination or other types of conspiracies in our world today. And uh, I have a whole video on my YouTube with Brent Lee, a former conspiracist, discussing this phenomenon and overlap. And it doesn't always mean that people get into conspiracy culture because of Atlantis or whatever. It, it, it could go either way, it's, but it's wrapped up in the same culture of anti-scholarship, anti-intellectualism, anti-science. And as a scientist, I think we have to address this and we have to use kind of research into best methods about how to go about that. So I'm very careful as well in how I engage to try to take advantage of the latest research into these topics, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll make sure that I put in the in the uh, description the link to your the Sapiens article that you wrote before the debate, which I think uh, really does a good job of overviewing uh, and expanding a lot of what you were just talking about with this this rise of conspiratorial stuff. And obviously, we all know this. We've all lived through the last few years and 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 the rise of anti vaccine uh, uh, anti vaccine conspiracies. Not the rhyming; those have always been there, but the explosion, let's say, of them during the pandemic. Uh, but also things like QAnon, uh, you know, quote unquote, serious, uh, serious uh, uh, conspiracies, ones that are are really scary in a way that we might. I don't know. One criticism I've sort of seen is like, oh, why do you guys care so much? You know, what's it matter if people believe in aliens or Atlantis? And to some extent, like, yeah. It, Whatever. I, it, it doesn't have a huge, other than just <laughs> caring about the truth or whatever, right? People having factual information, um, but it's not, it's, it's any debate, discussion about these things online people will Im almost immediately start talking about vaccines and they'll start talking about, uh, they'll start talking about, you know, uh, shady cabals who are controlling the world. Obviously that's been huge in the last couple of uh, months um, with, um, you know, criticisms of uh, other large YouTubers who are really, you know, kind of engaging in, 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 in really, you know, the kind of the same exact kind of language you see in some of these more quote unquote serious conspiracies. So I think you're right. There's this, there's this interlinking. And I also think it, you're right and that it doesn't always go you know we get into this sense of um like oh what we do is important because you know it's a pipeline that goes into those somebody can start in in uh watching graham hancock's show and then end up in QAnon. and i think that's probably true in some cases but that pipeline does go both ways we see people coming the other direction and they're coming to pseudo archaeology as a way of confirming that worldview and you never know if somebody finds comes to pseudo archaeology and they find that critical perspective coming from people who are saying this stuff's not true uh, you know that maybe that maybe that causes a domino effect back towards those other conspiratorial thoughts. I I don't know. At least for people who are still who are still capturable, which might not be everybody. 
I mean, I think what you say is really important. There's this reinforcement of ideology of sort of scholars and universities and academics are, I don't know, hiding stuff or bad actors or something like that. And uh, that exists and is pervasive along different conspiracy theories. After all, conspiracy theory can only succeed if you don't believe the legitimate evidence that we actually have that uh, most scientists present. And so, uh, so yeah, so th that sort of needed that kind of rhetoric of being anti-academic, anti-intellectual, anti-scholarship, anti-science, et cetera. And so I, I, I do think that we live in such a, we live in really difficult times <laughs> as we come to grips with how to deal with sort of the different kinds of communication uh, media that we have and the way that it's democratized information and voices and everything. I think that's really good overall. But uh, what we also see is we live in very charged periods, politically, culturally, socially, et cetera. And so I think, uh, I mean, a lot of people online, they always say everything you do is politics. And it's certainly true. I also think that that's a watered down way of things. I prefer to think of politics as specifically legal political institutional things simply because if, if 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 not then everything's politics so okay then whatever then it's a meaningless term if everything is politics we still need to distinguish polit the political sphere from other spheres and so in that sense i also try to be as minimally political as possible and by political i mean talking about you know factional elected bodies i don't mean talking about ethnicity and race and gender that's not politics that is very much science we st or, or and scholarship. We study ethnicity. We study gender. We study identity in the past as archaeologists all the time. We can't not study it because that's the evidence we have. And so, you know, we cannot be accused of being political because we bring up something like gender or race. That is a legitimate field of study that is not political at all in the sense of, you know, voting and, and Democrats, Republicans, Tories, liberals, et cetera, you know, that's politics, right? It doesn't tell you how to even pass laws with regards to race or gender or whatever. It's studying what people do in the past and to be accused of being political for talking about something like gender or race or even, you know, health in the past, like vaccines or whatever, that's ridiculous. That's what historians should be doing. We have to talk about relevant stuff that evidence actually has. And that's what archaeologists should and do. And we should do that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that counter argument like, oh, you're bringing politics in it. It's bad faith, right? It's just a way of trying to shut down conversation, right? And it is like conflating these two ideas of the fact that yeah, everything we do to some extent involves politics versus yeah, capital P politics. Like, are you a Tory or are you in the Labor Party or whatever? Right? Those are those are obviously separate things. Um, and uh, and you know, it's it, it can be challenging to sort of to sort of thread that needle. So uh, just to keep us sort of moving, jumping into the next question yeah. that I had. Um, I'm going to combine a couple here. Uh, I, one of the things I know you talked about a little bit in uh, in your uh, Sapiens article, and uh, you know when we chatted before the debate, we talked quite a bit about um, criticisms that might come from from archaeologists or from um, uh, science communicators about whether this was sort of a good idea. Uh, and um, again, I know in that article you talk about that a little bit, but people often sort of point to, oh, you know, there's the the ham nigh debate. There's these examples where um, that this doesn't um, uh, we're giving a platform or we're legitimizing guys like Graham Hancock by doing debates like this. So I guess I just wanted to give you a chance to to talk about your your thinking on that um, and if you took that into consideration when you decided whether you were going to do, do the debate and how you were going to prepare for it. Oops. Yeah, thanks, Bill. It's a good question. And as you know, since I talked to you about it a bunch, uh, yeah, that, I, that was definitely front and center. Um, what I wanted to ensure, look, I'm a precarious scholar. I do not have a permanent job. And so I did not want to destroy my career by doing this, right? And people, you know, it's funny, people that criticize me say, oh man, you did this to get wealthy or something. God, I've made no money off of it. I've had very few opportunities from it, that, have, that none that have resulted in any financial windfall at all, not a single one. And so, you know, it's just sort of like, uh, if anything, what was more was risk to my career, right? Because if I mess this up, in such a large venue with millions of people. And I mean, you know, millions of people saw it and we knew in advance millions of people would see it because of the size of Rogan's platform. And so, uh, you know, credit to him. He has by far the largest pla uh, podcast on any medium out there. And I mean, you know, 
triple, quadruple the numbers of any others. And, uh, and uh, the difference between number one and number two, when you look at the number of subscribers, is immense. And so, you know, this was front and center. And so I wanted to make sure that I did not screw myself up, right, and have all my colleagues hate me for doing this. So I did a bunch of research again. And, uh, you know, I went and read all the reactions to, like, the Bill Nye Ken Ham debate. And it's funny. I don't know why everybody sees that as a failure. There's, like, literally two articles in the aftermath of it that, that, that make that point. And... And the majority of them actually are very positive about his, uh, his his engagement there, that he really made clear, compelling points, and it convinced a lot of people. Um, but for some reason, the reason why it got entrenched that this was good for Ken Ham is he was able to, uh, to speed up his fundraising to build the Creation Museum right south of Cincinnati in Kentucky, northern Kentucky. And so uh, people saw that as, hey, this just played into Ken Ham's uh, hands. He was able to now get a bunch of uh, funds and build that museum. That museum probably would have been built anyway. It was already into fundraising and everything. It sped it up for sure. But, but second of all, I mean, if you look at sort of public opinion in the U.S. on the topic of evolution, it has been dropping ever since then. Probably not just entirely due to Bill Nye. I'm not trying to say that he deserves all the credit for it, but it certainly in no way harmed public belief in creationism. And if anything, the data would seem to show the opposite. And so it sort of got me thinking, you know, we have this perception. Don't go and talk to people on the pseudoscience sort of end of things. It only creates bad news. And I actually think that that is a myth. It is received wisdom that is not backed up by the evidence that you can actually look and see. If you go and look it up, look up the articles in the aftermath, even some of the people that, that today believe that they wrote, you know, 10 years ago, that the debate went really well for, for Bill Nye. I'm not going to name any of the people because I know some of them and I just interviewed one but uh, for my YouTube. But uh, so, yeah, so that was one of my big thinkings was rethinking that Bill Nye Ken Ham thing. The other one is I really don't believe in this idea that we're legitimizing these people. These people have the platform right now. There is no archaeologist anywhere near as famous as as, as the non-archaeologist Graham Hancock, who talks directly about archaeology, nor as famous as, you know, Yorgos Tsoukalos. I don't even know how to pronounce his name. But, uh, you know. Uh, Tsoukalos, whatever it is. Tsoukalos. Yeah, I mean, the I'm ancient aliens guy. Way. Yeah, the ancient <laughs> aliens guy. And so they are by far, they have a much larger platform than archaeologists have. So it's just total bullshit. I'm sorry. I'm going to say that. To think that we are legitimizing these people in the eyes of normal people. Netflix has already legitimized Graham Hancock. The History Channel has already legitimized ancient aliens. Amazon has legitimized all the pseudoscience writers who are listed as bestsellers like Graham Hancock is in that field, like archaeology. And so, you know, that onus is on Amazon and Netflix and not on me, right? I am not legitimizing this guy at all. Instead, I'm actually providing real information in a real way that, that, that's well-researched and presented to actually act as a counter. And so that was my goal and, and that was my intention and how I thought about that. I was actually very worried about the response from people in the community who I knew in advance did not want me to do this. I knew several people, some of whom I'm friendly with, some of whom I'm not, some of whom I barely know, that, uh, that, that did not think it was a good idea for me to do this and were very much against it. And I expected a wave of op-eds about that. And it never materialized, which I'm very, very thankful for, um, because I'm still looking for jobs. If you have a tenure check position, hire me. I'm a good <laughs> public community. And a good scholar. <laughs> hit hit Flynn up if you got any job, any job, uh, job uh, possibilities <laughs> out there. Seriously, seriously. Um, yeah, that was definitely a concern of mine too going into it was that backlash from um, from archaeologists. And my criticism has always been, I think not even that the, some of the old uh, research was bad, but that it's just old, right? Like we live in such a different world nowadays. Um, people have such access to different forms of legitimate communication right where we've got we've got you know youtubers with millions of subscribers podcasters with millions of subscribers um spouting pseudoscience stuff we're just we're just in a very different landscape than we were even 10 years ago and certainly 20 or 25 years ago and as scholars it's very easy right like a 10 year old paper is not that old in in like the world of peer review right if you're reading a paper from 2014 that's still like, oh, that's relatively new. That's still like, right, that could be, unless there's been newer stuff that's obviously kind of gone against it. But a 2014 bit of research about 
internet culture might as well be from the stone age right it might as well be from yeah. it might as well be from uh from some other universe that's so long ago this is the, we just live in such a different uh digital world so i really i really agree with that all right so just skipping forward now the debate has happened the the uh, we, 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 we've 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 finished the the preamble for the debate. I know we didn't talk so much about uh sort of how you prep for it. I know that you spoke to a lot of scholars. Uh, you, and 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 um and maybe if you want to speak to that in this next answer, um, feel free to do that. But you spoke to a lot of different people, which is was weirdly criticized. Actually, let's 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 do that really quick first. I was so. That was the strangest Twitter interaction I have seen was somebody who we don't need to bother naming because he's 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 sort of a pathetic soul on the Internet, uh, but who came at you and was critical of the fact that you had colluded <laughs> by talking to lots of archaeologists before the debate and asking lots of questions uh, uh and and uh, and um, including including me but people much more knowledgeable about the stuff that really mattered in the debate experts on the stuff you knew was going to come up things like ice cores and things like like this different sites that were of course going to be discussed about uh and and you did all that preparation and that was a weird angle of attack to see somebody say preparing for the debate was bad because you were colluding or something. So I don't know, I guess, could you tell us a little bit about what your thinking was there and whether you think that was key to ultimately how the debate went uh, in terms of your preparation? Yeah, I mean, look, the whole accusation of collusion, that's just part of conspiracy rhetoric, right? It's the idea that this is a conspiracy to keep these people down, right? And, and, and they were all working together all the time to do that kind of thing. I mean, God, I put you know, a tiny percentage of my time into preparing for this data a debate. I took two weeks of leave, right? You know, I took two weeks, something like that. It was a week and a half, two weeks of annual leave, my own vacation time to prepare and deal with uh, this debate and, and go and do it as well. And so, you know, it's just like, I, 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 I need help <laughs> to be honest. I'm an expert in certain things. And that was another reason why I chose to approach the topic of Atlantis in particular is because of my own expertise. I am an expert in the archaeology and history of ancient Greece. I've read Plato in the original Greek. I've, I have I study materials from ancient Athens and I've excavated all over the Greek world. That's my specialty. So I'm well positioned to address the origin of Atlantis and stuff like that. At the same time, my dad being an Ice Age archaeologist who studied the Paleolithic you know, period, I grew up excavating on stone age sites from near the end of the ice age you know and so from the late pleistocene so and i'm very familiar with that research because i was very close with my dad right and i kept up with what he was doing and so uh he's very very much missed this goes to you dad but uh you know like so in that sense if you're going to address the modern version of atlantis you need to be somehow an expert in both classical greece and the pleistocene and there's almost nobody that is that and so that was one of the reasons why I sort of felt like a, a, my duty to actually think about Atlantis, because there's very few people who have the expertise. I'm one of uh, just a handful. I don't know who else even, but I'm sure there might be some others um, based on their idiosyncrasy of what they research um, who could do that. But I'm one of very few. But to be able to approach this kind of topic of a lost civilization at the end of the Ice Age, that require and globally, that requires expertise that nobody in the world has. You need to really be an expert in every single subfield of archaeology. And none of us are that. The archaeology is way too big of a discipline. As I sort of started off on Joe Rogan, I showed this great map created by the Spanish PhD student who shared it with me, where it has you know hundreds of thousands of sites just in sort of the Horn of Africa. And so we have millions of sites. Nobody can be an expert on that around the world. It's just not possible. Even after, you know, at the height of your career, at the age of 85, you're not going to be able to talk about everything in archaeology. And so I realized my, the limits of what I know. And so I got in touch with, you know, a, about a dozen people, I, I think. Uh, I have a list of it on my video response after the debate. And uh, I reached out to all these people to try to get different perspectives on how to respond and address this question so that they could share reading with me, so that they could share images from their own teaching lectures or research lectures. And I gave credit fully, you know, for all those images that were shared with me. I even showed some clips of some of those scholars. And that's why, because, you know, to get the best information possible for the audience, and it's a large audience, I want to go there with the best information possible. I wanted to make sure that I talked with as many people as I could so that I could have, you know, all my I's dotted and my T's crossed 
And of course, I'm still accused of not having that, but that's pretty much all friggin' lies. But whatever, we can talk about that later. But uh, so that was my approach because I am someone who recognizes my own limits. You know, I can't be an expert in everything. And so I wanted some uh, help. And, and thankfully, people were happy to help. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's a fundamental like advantage that a guy like Hancock is always going to have is that. You don't have to be well researched at all. You can just, if you're just spouting from the hip and just, hip and just talking, you know, describing what you see, and and uh, and and you know, you could write whole books without hardly doing any any research, right? Uh, you know, so as as scientists, right, we have to do that kind of collaboration. We have to collaborate. We have to work together to say anything bigger than our own tiny little narrow subfield. And yeah, I agree with you completely. Trying to address pseudo archaeology is maybe the most extreme example of that because they usually are drawing from sites and ideas all over the world and they will jump, you know, what about this site in Indonesia? What about this site in 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 Finland? What about this site in Brazil? They'll just jump like crazy, right? And try and, and get you. And nobody, it's like, I, I can't talk about, uh, that's not where I study. I need to talk to so-and-so who knows about Brazilian archaeology or whatever it might be. Exactly. And I've, I've also, I've, I, I mute my criticism as much as possible towards colleagues who are acting in good faith, but I've seen people respond to pseudo-archaeology claims and provide not actually factual responses about sites that are in different areas of the world and periods that they know nothing about. And so th that's always kind of irked me a little bit where uh, I've seen people, you know, talk about Atlantis in ways that make no sense with they've, they've clearly not read actual modern 21st century scholarship uh, written by you know people who study Plato on on Atlantis and then they're addressing it and it's just like uh you know this is an issue and so you know like one of the big ones I saw was Gunung Padang and uh, you know people for a long time were addressing Gunung Padang and providing data that uh, that I could not verify when I tried to research it. And so that's why I eventually was able to find the excavator of the site, Ludfi Yondri, who'd excavated there for many campaigns and published a book on it, who actually knew the real archaeology of it. And that's why I put that video together was because it's like, we are all shooting from the hip in the dark if we're trying to address these theories that are bogus and have no evidence about Gunung Padang. We are not well equipped to do it because all the literature is in Indonesian. And so, you know, we need to create a document somewhere in English. Archaeology Magazine just published a great article. They reached out to me after my YouTube video came out, the author of the article, to get in touch with Luffy so that they could work with him to produce a great article which just came out in Archaeology Magazine on the real archaeology of Gunung Padang. Ooh, and so it's just – yeah, it just came out a couple of days ago. I saw it on social media and, and looked through it. And, and Luffy Yondri is credited all over, and he clearly was a major contributor to the – knowledge and data and images behind that article as well as my video and so you know i very much think we all need to sometimes i wish some of, some of us would talk a little less frequently um and 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 step back and if we don't really have a a, a good answer we should chill out for a second um because i think we need to be careful about what we say so that uh, that said I mean, screw it. In the end, I got critiqued for every little thing I said. Um, it's it's it, hard because you fall, you, fall stuff, for, so. you fall for the trap, like, right? It's it is a, it is you're being set up for a trap because people demand that you give them answers right then, and you're kind of pissed off. And I get you know I get why why it happens, and I'm sure I've done it. I've done it myself. I know with like Ganung Padang, like I, a lot of us when we were first criticizing that. I tried to stick very much to like methodological criticisms because those were the things that yes. you could actually speak about. Right. But it was very much like a, I don't, is it possible that there's a site that's 25,000 years old in this area of the world? I actually don't have that answer again, without doing a no. tremendous <laughs> amount of research. And the answer turns out to be no, but, uh, but it's like, I can't just say but, and, that. I can't just say there's no chance this site's real because I, I don't have the background for that. Right. And, so and we can't that was say so what, and, and the thing is, is Gunung Padang is a great real site. And without knowing, I, the only way I found the date of the site was through talking to Lutfi, right? Because mm -hmm. online, there's so much different divergence in the dates, right? But he's the one that's dug under the walls and gotten radiocarbon samples from under the walls that date it right from literally in context and so it's like you you need that real information we can't just go and say this is a site from 2000 years ago something like 2200 if i remember right um that's what it dates to and so it's like you need that information to really address that claim what is this site actually you know and so yeah so i think it's tough and i mean look we're we're always going to get critique anyway from people who are going to make up stuff like we're colluding but uh, we should be careful still about trying to make sure that we're, we're going to present the real information about what's going on the best we can. Um, 
And so, yeah, that's that's something I firmly believe. Yeah, humility super important in that sense. Uh, so, so now, so now, actually, jumping to after the debate, the 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 the, the I think some of the some of the the lack of criticisms. Uh, you know, I was expecting those op eds too. I was fully expecting. That. I really was was that's I was that's what I was looking for. I was waiting for, you know, I'd certain people in my mind who I thought would be the ones writing them, uh, or people who I maybe wouldn't even expect. And and I did. It, that's not to say that there was no criticism. I did see some people on Twitter and places like that saying, "Oh, I don't think this this was a great idea," but it was very reasonable, right? It was people who were just yeah. genuinely trying to talk out this, you know, complicated, not perfect, zero sum discussion about the positive positive or negative impacts of this. But we did, I think, right away notice a lot of really interesting data, like the discussions on, you know, Hancock's subreddit, where there were a lot, where just, there were a lot of people in there who were saying, wow, you know, I think he made some good points or, uh, and nastiness. I mean, reading through there, I can't imagine you would have wanted to, like, I, I don't know. I don't know if you ever dived in there, but there was some really gross, disgusting stuff. But there were also a lot of people who were like, wow, this really made me think. And this really made Graham look like he didn't, he was talking about. Uh, so there was that, uh, maybe we could talk about this kind of roll this in about the kind of positive and negative impacts of the debate that you feel happened. But let me kind of try to couch it in this question. Have you been sort of surprised at all about how Graham himself has reacted in the months in the it, since the debate? What do you sort of make of that? What does that say to you about how the debate went uh, or 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 how he thinks it went or anything like that? <laughs> um. Well, I'm going to start off not answering that question. Sorry, just to start no. off. I was amazingly surprised by the response in the immediate aftermath, like in the first month afterwards. I went in there not thinking that I would primarily be speaking to people in the middle, people who maybe saw Ancient Apocalypse or read a Graham Hancock, but weren't necessarily invested in Graham Hancock and his ideas. And, uh, you know, they'd heard of him or something. And, and those were the people I was really trying to address, people who had not made up their minds on anything and wanted to hear what a legitimate archaeological perspective was on it. Um, and so that was the response from that community was fantastic. And I, I, I expected that, though, or hoped for it, let's say. What I did not really hope for and I was shocked by was the response from many Graham Hancock fans. I personally received... I don't know how many hundreds of, of messages on maybe thousands on Twitter, public and private on Twitter, email, YouTube, elsewhere, Facebook, from people who told me they were fans of Graham Hancock for years, and now they realize the problems with his arguments. And and you could you like you said, you can go on Reddit. Hell, you can go on 4chan and see that response. Uh, the rest of the response is even grosser and more ugly than what's on Reddit, um, by far. Um, even the people that, that that thought I did a great job say some really nasty things about me that I will never, ever repeat or don't even want to think about. No violence or anything like that, just, just nastiness. Um, and so, uh, at least not physical violence, I mean. Um, and so I was shocked. And, and that's where we get to the response from Graham which is that I was also shocked that he was completely silent. For about a month after the debate, he was completely silent. And even, even since that first month, where he has obliquely referenced the debate by promoting certain YouTube videos and stuff like that, uh, he has not really given it his full voiced thoughts on this. He's never written a, a post on his website, for example, his primary venue where he shares his thoughts. No. He's 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 posted uh, other people's writing on his website, like you know critiques of Mini Minuteman by uh, the Holly Skinner, um, and so he or or Manu's the the article on the Edfu uh, text that he just uh, put on his blog, and so he's never he has not addressed this at all, um, and that tells me that he recognizes that uh, a large segment of people no longer think his ideas are in any way plausible. Um, and this goes back to a debate I have with a different YouTuber back a long time ago, Dan Richards. Uh, he was complaining that uh, that archaeologists treat 
um, people who believe in this lost civilization from the Ice Age as if they're flat earthers. And to be honest, the evidence for this kind of lost civilization is equivalent to believing in a flat earth. It really is. Anyone who is familiar with all the evidence we have from the end of the Ice Age, not a single person, not a single scholar thinks that there's any credence to that. Not a single one. Name me one archaeologist whose focus is the late Pleistocene who even thinks that that's a plausible idea. Not one. Never. Not even any of the people that are scholars like chemists or whatever, like Martin Sweatman, who believe in this kind of idea. Not a single, even some of the people who are students in archaeology, like Mark Young, who, who believe in this idea. None of them have a fo research focus on the end of the Ice Age. And so, you know, it's just like, this is literally like believing in flat Earth, because there's not just no evidence for it, there's evidence against it. And so it's just like, that's how secure the archaeology is on this topic. And now it, there's a clear point where people can go to see that. And it's been revealed as completely implausible. The whole goal that these people have had is to try to sell it as a possible idea that's worth thinking about. I'm sorry. It's not just that there's no evidence. There's evidence against it. It is completely implausible. There's a preponderance of evidence against it. And so, you know... That, I think, was read very loud and clear. And I think that Graham probably, I can't speak for him. I've had no private communication with him after afterwards. But uh, I think he probably recognizes that. And I think he realizes that his fan base was hit pretty badly. And that the idea of this concept was as plausible is now gone from the majority of people out there. Um, I do think there's been some retrenchment among hardcore fans. But uh, yeah, I think that that's the general prevailing consensus that I've seen among, you know, even many people interested in conspiracy theories. I mean, pseudo archaeology, I should say. Um, so yeah. yeah. I mean, you started to get into a little bit what my one of my last questions here was, was the rise of some of these personalities. And I think you've, we have sort of Dan Richards um, uh, and, uh, and Holly Skinner or it's an illegitimate scholar guy, right? Some of these folks who come out and are, I mean, sort of breathtakingly bad faith and uh, and nasty at times, and um, and often um, uh, verging on abusive, I would say, uh, in some cases, uh, in harassment in the way that they've treated scholars, and that Graham is been boosting these people uh and resharing their ideas even the ones that are just just obviously incorrect it's i don't know i don't know i don't know what that means right because it's a i died and i was not like a huge graham hancock like follower before the last couple of years so i don't know if his normal reaction to something in the past i feel like like in the past you know so if if hoops if john hoops was was his biggest you know named critic for many for many years um I, I feel like he used to go at hoops directly all the time uh so to see him just be silent and let these kind of proxies who are far nastier than ever than he ever was and far more underhanded than he ever was sort of speak for him is uh it's disturbing it's distressing so uh that's that's not even a question that's just 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 my <laughs> no know? i agree i think uh I think, and it's weird, and he's invited me to reply to what other people say, and it's like, why should I reply to a YouTuber with a couple, you know, 10,000, 20,000 followers? Like, what, 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 uh, that's, you know, that's giving legitimacy to someone who does not deserve legitimacy, if you see what I mean. Like, like, uh, like, Hancock, on the other hand, is legitimate, because he's a best-selling author with a top-viewed show. That's, he's a legitimate force, and I'm happy to address stuff that Hancock talks about. But I'm not going to sit there. He's invited me to reply to like two or three, three different people, I think, four actually, four different people's content about what I've said on the debate. And it's like, no, I'm not going to do that. Like, why should I waste my time? I'm not here at people's beck and call to respond to everything. I have a job that I am doing. I have re other research. I have a variety of hobbies. I have a wife. I have a cat. I have, you know, all kinds of, I have a life, you know? And so I'm not going to sit here and respond to every little thing and get into every argument over every little thing over, I don't know, is a canoe a ship? Like, Jesus Christ, it's still called a shipwreck, man. Regardless, in archaeological databases, a shipwreck is a shipwreck, whether it's a tiny boat or a large ship. Like, I don't know what else to tell you. That is not real real or me what was it i i refer to 
uh, feralization of, 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 of plants. And I say one thing, and then the next sentence later, I say, actually, Joe and Graham, I don't know about this. I'm not even sure if the research has been done. I don't know how long it takes for feralization to happen. And to only respond to the part before I say, I don't know, as if I didn't say that, cut that out of context. Um, you know, it's just kind of like, I will admit they have literally, this will be the only time I admit this, I made one mistake that they have called up, literally just one. I showed the, this figure that I got from a scientific article that cited a UN estimate of shipwrecks, and it estimated that there are millions of shipwrecks out there. Um, what I did not gather in my reading when I pulled up that figure was that that was an estimate of the total number of shipwrecks that exist, it was not a reflection of how many shipwrecks have been actually explored. So what that means is instead of 3 million, there's 300,000 shipwrecks that have been explored. And it doesn't change the substance of my point about shipwrecks and the extent of the exploration that underwater archaeologists have done and the fact that we have explored the continental shelves underwater and we have a good sense of what is there. But I will admit that that was my one factual mistake out of every single one that these people have pulled out. The rest of the critiques about me from ice cores to feralization to whatever is all bogus. It either cuts me out of context or it is actually a misreading of the archaeological evidence itself. And so, you know, it's just like, but, but screw them. You know, I'm not going to waste my time with these people. I mean, I've been debating whether to make a video about this, and I don't know. I still might because I get swarmed with comments from people that have seen, in particular, the first video that, that, that Graham promoted. And so it's just like, I don't know what to do about this. I don't want to legitimize this YouTuber. I view him as very bad faith. He has attacked me, and he has personally been stalking me by making tons of videos about me and lying about me and knowingly lying about me. He knows he's lied about me being, a, a, he, he, he accused me of being a researcher at Dartmouth University who handled indigenous remains. He did this both on Twitter and YouTube. He knew I I was not affiliated with Dartmouth College. Sorry, Dartmouth College. At that time, I taught at Dartmouth for one year. I taught in the classics department, and I was never even in person at Dartmouth. It was during the pandemic. It was entirely online. I've never even been to Dartmouth College, not even once in my life. And we told him that. I told him that before I blocked him. I told him that, other people told him that, and then he persisted by making a video about it, even though he knew that it was a lie. Even though he absolutely knew. I do not know why Dartmouth College still has a profile for me. They have profiles for plenty of people who are no longer employed by them. That is not me. That is just, they keep that up there, there. And just like universities keep email addresses and stuff like that. And so, you know, it's just like, I don't know what else to say. You look, I have my own information about who I am out there online. That's the top result on Google, Bing, or whatever search. And he chose to do that. And he knew that was false. And yet he, and so. That one, sorry. That one, that one really pissed me off. I mean, he's infuriating. He's infuriating. He's, 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 and those who are in the know, know who, who we're talking about here. And he's, he, 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 and, and honestly, I, I don't really see a big difference between him and like Holly Skinner's art, Holly, Holly Lasko Skinner's article about, about Milo Rossi. Uh, I or don't, about me. I, yeah. Or, or the one about you. Yeah. Like it's, it's like these people, they're not, when I, when I say they're bad faith, what I mean is that exactly that they are not trying to understand the truth. They're not trying to see if you misrepresent the data, they are searching through things to try and find a lot gotcha. of ang angles of attack. That's what it's yeah. all about. Dan Dan has never read any, as far as I could tell, he has never engaged with any subject f out of interest. Every single time I've seen him talk about a subject, it is him word searching journal articles. I mean, he interviewed a, a, an actual scholar who wrote an article, misrepresented what the article said. And then when the, when the author told him he was wrong, he said, no, you're wrong about the article he wrote. It's the guy's yeah. article. It's like, so he's, that's just, I mean, we shouldn't, we'll just, we'll just both. No, 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 no. I, I'll, I'll talk about that really quickly. Cause I actually got in touch with that ice core scientist after that for, for that video came out and the, the, I'm not going to name him because he asked me not to, he doesn't want to be involved in these debates, which makes perfect sense as he gets so 
so much hatred. He's like, your following is filled, not my following, but you engage with people who are nasty and 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 making this just nasty stuff. And he was just like appalled. He's like, I cannot believe that he called you a liar like that. That's not what we do in science. We disagree with each other and critique each other. We don't call each other liars. And so he was just like, and so he went to Twitter and said, Flint did not lie about this. And so he said that very clearly without me requesting him to either. And so it's just like, you know, I, I don't know what to say. That is just the definition of bad faith to go and research somebody who is a specialist in a topic, to, to use that as your authority, to claim someone's lying. Then when that researcher says, I'm not, I never said he was lying. I was trying to inform you about how ice core studies actually work. And you're twisting this. Then the accused that scholar is just like, man, this is just this is just bad faith. And it's like that rice feralization thing. He pulls that quote, ignoring the fact that the very next sentence I, I said, actually, wait a second. I don't know the answer to this question. I assume it could be a thousand years because that's how long it takes for these changes in domestication to take. But I do not know that answer. That is what I said. Go look it up on Joe Rogan. It's like hour two, literally around 202, 203, this conversation is somewhere around there. And it's just like, maybe I'm off by five minutes, but it's around that time. And so it's just like, you know, that's there. I, 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 that's what I said. And so, yeah, I don't, I don't know what else to say. That's just bad faith and aggression. Yeah. There's, I, 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 I agree completely. And I've, I've just, I, I don't know. I've, I've started, I, I don't use my block function that much, but, but uh, he's, he's a rare exception because, uh, because he's actually, he's actually quite, um, he's quite mean. He's, he's quite, he's quite, quite, uh, quite, quite abusive and manipulative. Like, right. Like that, what he did to that, the researcher we've just been discussing, he's, he's done that with several people and several archeologists as well, where he's, he's cozied up to them, pretended like he's, you know, just wants to know the truth. And then he turns on them and treats them like shit. He's kind of done that with all of us, but we're already at an hour. Uh, so we should move. Not right. We're end. at 50. We started we're, late. So. We, start, we did start a little yeah. late. That's true. That's true. We're, we're, we're like, I, I, I don't, I, I'm also like, I don't want to upset you. I know this is, this stuff is like so frustrating. No, no, no. But I think it's important to talk about it. And look, I, I block all the time because look, especially since the Joe Rogan debate, but even before I am trolled and I get people that hate follow me just to reply to stuff. And it's like, look, I don't want my tweets to be swarmed by hate. I don't want my tweets to be swarmed by either hatred or bigotry or by pseudoscience. I don't want the replies to my tweets or my YouTube to be swarmed by that stuff. I prefer to, you know, to have my little corner of the internet, which me being a minor, minor Z level celebrity, as low on the celebrity chain as you can get, I still want my little corner of the internet to be a place for wholesome real science. Okay, that is what I want. And if you're going to come and troll me and hate follow me, I'm sorry, you're being blocked immediately. I have had thousands of people say some very nasty things about me. And if you're going to say that I'm lying and not give me any benefit of the doubt, even though I've written about this and talked about it, sorry, you're being blocked immediately. That's just how it is. I'm not spending time I, on that one. I think the value of that video, you know, you were trying to say, do I, do I make that video or not? If nothing else, then that video exists so that people can simply just copy and paste it into the reply and say, ah, oh, here's the deal with that. And when people are like, he, yeah. he lied about shipwrecks or whatever. And be like, no, he didn't. And then you just have it and the person can go and see your sort of rebuttal. But other than that, I don't know. I, I think it's, I think that there's a reasonable, you know, kind of sense of what's, you don't even need to engage with this stuff because it's so bad faith. And I think you're right, right? When we do talk about, to be nuanced about that conversation about science communication and giving platforms, right? There is a difference between a conversation with a guy like Graham Hancock and a guy like Dan Richards who who exists to try and skim fame off of the people who he's nasty to. Like that's really his whole goal. Uh, and and it's, uh, so yeah, I don't, I don't think it's actually... That is that is the place where folks who are critical of this kind of engagement have a point, right? Like that's that I that I would agree with. I'd say I don't know we're doing any good by engaging with guys like that. Um, yeah. Versus, versus it's also I was that. busy. Look, summertime's busy for me doing archaeology. I was coming up near the end of my research contract, and it's like. I just don't have the time to deal with this shit. I have a life and a job, right? You know, and so that's why I've been toying with now that this contract is, is about to end uh, to, to, to think about a response to that. It would take some work, though, because I need to make sure that I frame it in the right way so that I do that. And so, you know, this response maybe is the first step towards that. And uh, I'm still mulling in my brain. Yeah.
Yeah, no, a video like that takes a long time. Yeah, to do the research yeah. and then and then put it together and edit it. It's that's that's a lot of work. And um, and what's the and, message you're trying to make? You know, what is the message you are trying to have there is another big goal. And so I always want to think what is my actual learning outcome from my public communication? It's just like preparing for teaching a university level class. I actually consistently argue with my, not argue, I consistently when I give talks in academic settings about public engagement, I actually want to, I want every, all of us to approach it like we're teaching an intro level course. With all of what we do, I think it should be like prepping uh, for a day teaching. What is your learning outcome? What are you trying to get people to understand that's going to make them grok, get what we do better about archaeology and why it's relevant in today's world or cool or interesting or whatever it is? What really is the learning outcome we're shooting for and how can we best achieve that just like we do when we prepare for teaching a day at university in a classroom, right? Yeah, that's sort of a beautiful transition into what was my my last real question here was what what to what what's your advice for um what do we do next you know where where do we go from here right we've had this we've had this debate you did this debate i think uh overall it was a uh, it was um um a positive experience that that did more good than harm uh the 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 landscape has shifted again we have new voices arising in the pseudo archaeology community and in the science communication community uh tensions are as high perhaps as they've ever been there uh and and a whole lot of millions of people who are who are viewing this and trying to decide what they think and what they uh how they're going to judge all of this so so i guess that's my sort of last question is what's your advice on what we should do next what do we do now yeah, I mean, so I have two answers to that. One, I think that hopefully, and I know you disagree with me a little bit because of how you engage on Twitter. Well, but I, I, listen, I disagree with myself on Twitter a lot. So I, I, I have two. I this is why I could never. I don't think I could have done the Joe Rogan interview you did because I, do, I, I have less saint-like patience than you do. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think I think. Look, I do I do hope that my colleagues see that and and, and other kinds of outreach that we do and try to actually prepare for it like we're teaching a class. Like I said, there I, it was a good transition because it's what I actually believe. I believe that if we're gonna engage with the public, we need to think about best practices. If we're gonna engage on the topic of pseudoscience in particular, we need to think about best practices. And so I think we need to do research on how uh, the, how to be effective about engaging with pseudoscience in today's 21st century world. I, I believe that the, the playbook developed by Carl Sagan that the skeptics have used for a few decades now is way out of date at this point by constantly saying, show me the evidence. You put the ball back in the court of pseudoscientists and conspiracy theorists. We need to be working with pre-bunking and what uh, I write in my Guardian article about truth sandwiches. And so we need to, in that sense, take the skills that we have from being effective teachers and, and think about how to apply them to our public engagement, whether we're addressing pseudoscience or not. And so I really hope that more people, this is one of Milo Rossi's big points, more people need to get on YouTube. Um, I really hope that more people get on either YouTube or TikTok or podcasting. Those are, in my mind, the three largest uh, ways to reach people in an impactful manner. And I, I, I think that it, I, I did it for a while on Twitter. I think that those days are past for Twitter. I think there's still some room for places like Twitter and Facebook, but I think that uh, that there's that it's not as impactful anymore because you end up getting dragged down into arguments back and forth. And there's other issues with how the platforms have started, you know, diverging after Elon Musk took over. It's no longer as much of a cross section of people that Twitter used to be because so many people left after Elon Musk took over. And so now you're just addressing the people that are left. And it's a different kind of community, you know, that, that, that boosts up different kinds of things than it used to. And so uh, so I, I tend to think that YouTubing TikTok uh, podcasting, those are really the ways to go. They're the type of media that people approach. I think writing is still effective, but I think that other there's other ways to reach more people in a sense. And I think in that sense, our, our, our training and experience teaching is our best goal here. We should be approaching the public, if we're, especially if we're addressing adults, like they are adults. We should not ever infantilize them. We should never be dumbing down what archaeology is about. And we should make sure that we approach them like they are basically our students. We should, we should you know, in a sense, and it, it doesn't mean approach the pseudo archaeologists like they're our students. It means approaching the public like they are, right? And sometimes we have some students that are, you know, 
unruly, let's say, but we still try to shepherd them through our class, right? They're, they might not be as interested and we still work with them and give them that respect. And I think we need to do that for people on the internet as well and how we engage um, and, and use those techniques of how to even address sort of a disruptive student in class. How do you handle that in a classroom? We should think about that in the online sphere as well. And so, you know, I think we should be, we should be engaging. We have to engage. We no longer have the advantage of 20th century media where because we are experts, we are platformed. Um, instead, we need to, we need to, we're, we're on the back step here because alternative media and alternative uh, historians, let's say, they had a running start in building up what the YouTube algorithm is, what the TikTok algorithm is and how it responds, as you know, I'm sure, from creating content. When you do something on a conspiracy topic, a pseudo-archaeology topic, it does better than a non-pseudo-archaeology topic. And that has something to do with they planted the seeds first in that kind of environment. So and it's how the algorithm works. And it's what people are interested in today's world, debunking or pre-bunking or whatever. They're interested in that. And so we need to leverage that to teach people about what we do and why it matters. Um, I had another big point. Oh, I also think that as a community of science communicators, and archaeology communicators and history communicators, we need to become more cohesive. And so I've talked to you about this. I want to organize an online festival or carnival, as I want to call it. I want to call it guys, an online carnival where every single person who does legitimate archaeological communication, whether they're an expert or not, who has a YouTube channel or a podcast or a TikTok or a Twitter or a blog or whatever, we all do for like a weekend. We take over the airwaves and we, we do something on this. And so I want to organize that. Like, let's do it right when we hang up. Um, we want to, we want to do this and I want to get this out maybe sometime in September. We can have a big festival where ever, and it should make us mo more cohesive as a group so that we can share followers and subscribers with each other, so that we can train the algorithms that if you like archaeology on Bill Farley's channel, Archaeology Tube, you'll also like it on Flint Dibbles and vice versa. And Mini Minutemans, I noticed from my YouTube statistics that a lot of my people who watch my stuff are interested in pseudo-archaeology content. And it's like, it's not that I don't want you. That's not true at all. I want anyone who, want, who likes to watch my videos to watch my videos. But I want to make sure that people who are interested, legitimately interested in real archaeology, know how to find me via these algorithms. And we can train them and we can cohere together as a, as a community and develop further collaborations and ways to be able to popularize the real cool stuff direct from the source, you know, the real archaeology. And so that's what I want to do. And so that's what I want to move forward on is to try to make this stuff more popular. Um, that's that's uh, I, I think people like archaeology. That much is really clear. They just don't know how to find the real stuff because we're drowned out by these other voices. And so I want them to be able to find us more easily. Um, not just me, but all, all my other colleagues that are doing this. And I, you know, we shouldn't be existing in different spheres. We should be coming together as a community and promoting each other. You know, I, I agree with that completely. I think that's exactly, I think that's exactly right. I do think that, yeah, like it's uh, the, the algorithms on places like Twitter and stuff just drag you into arguments. That's what does well. And that's to a certain extent, like you said, what happens here on YouTube as well. Like, yeah, videos that are, have an argumentative stance do better. And if you're trying to build an audience, that's, that's the only way to do it. But the, this alternate way where where we kind of rise together as a group of ships is a is a good one yeah and that's we have talked about that before and i do i'm super on board uh for that want to and want to do that because um you know other other communities have done that in the past on youtube and been really successful they've kind of hacked the algorithm by 20 creators get together they all talk about a similar subject at the same time and it just becomes the story right and then they all use each other and each other's videos they use each other for voiceovers they do interviews they do you know they find these ways to sort of make connections so the 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 pitch i'll make for that is i do it in almost every video i have a big old playlist uh here on my channel search through it and find it uh and in there uh, Flint's obviously on there, but there's something like, I don't know, there's dozens of really good archaeology channels on there on YouTube.
YouTube and go through just just subscribe to all those and put and click the notification bell on all those if you think archaeology is cool because every one of those channels is doing interesting stuff and they're not all professional archaeologists like Flint or I some of them are folks um, but I like I really take your idea about right we have certain skills as teachers you might be surprised for the part the archaeologists out there who's watching this um, you know you have a huge advantage in some of these spaces because you can talk, right? You can research, you can, you can uh, write, right? You have these skills and, that we have, bring those. And you bear. know that, you know, the people who are experts in various little topics. And yeah. so you can help raise them or ask them questions or whatever. You know, we are the ones who do the research and do the teaching at the most advanced level in the world at the universities. Right. And uh, so it's just like, yeah, we, we, we need to share that. We need uh, Look, so much of information is, is becoming democratized. But if we stay behind tuition payments, well, then, that, then there's going to be a continuing rise in anti-intellectual thoughts. You know, we, we, our, what we do should not only be for the privileged who can attend university. Okay. And so, you know, I think that that's an issue. Yeah. Yeah. So start a YouTube channel. That's the takeaway from today. <laughs> <laughs> or a podcast or a TikTok. Or a po yeah. And if you do... Let us know, you know, get it, get yeah. it, reach out to one of us, one of, you know, the, the folks who are making this kind of content, you know, get connected and, and, uh, and, and, and be a part. If you already have something like that and you've got a hundred subscribers and you don't know how to grow from there, not that neither of us are huge, huge, huge people in this space yet. Yet. Uh, yet but uh but uh <laughs> but you know like right we've you know put a couple of years into this now of trying to grow something that's at least uh, enough that some people are watching it right so yeah. um that's it we get we'll get together and sort of do that so i've got to i i'm i've got to cut us off just because i've got to go to a, no, to good. an appointment in a minute but uh i have about two minutes but just as sort of an outro uh just to 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 reiterate um you know we've been speaking to dr flint dibble here uh and uh, check out uh his youtube channel which is archaeology at flint dibble i think it's just at flint dibble right is that what it's or is it at archaeology at what it's it, at how, flint dibble at flint dibble so you yeah. just put an F with them. And again, of course, I'll have it down in the description here as well. Uh, and and subscribe there. Go find that list of channels. Uh, hit subscribe for this channel, of course, right? You know, turn on those do notifications. It. Why not? Let's do it. <laughs> um, and we'll sort of grow that. And yeah, keep an eye out for um, in the next in the next couple of months, uh, us trying to do this because we've been talking about it for months. And it's it's we're finally in a place where I think we can all we're gonna do it. make it happen. So let's do we're it. We're going to do it. All right. Oh, thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Yeah. <laughs>